to your uh, approximately eight, ten uh, community college teachers into um, you know, essentially folding them into the PIRO program. And, uh, and so you'll be uh, having a chance to look at some of the posters that they um, generated over their uh, period of time here doing the research. One of the major uh, outputs for the, the um, community college teachers is actually to translate the research they do into um, modules, teaching modules, which they will bring back to uh, their um, jobs as community college teachers and literally impact uh, thousands of lives um, and maybe um, influence a lot of young folks to think about engineering and urban water sustainability in particular. So that's kind of the big picture. Um, I also wanted to acknowledge a few people who um, may be here or um, will be here as I understand it. Um, so from the water agencies, we have John Kong from Orange County Public Works, and I don't know if he's here yet, but I know that he's coming, he's so good. And Ian Swift from the Irvine Ranch Water District. So uh, hopefully they're, um, they're on their way. Um, we also, I also want to acknowledge the uh, postdocs on the PIRO program who really ran this entire program, both the field work as well as all the data analysis. Um, without them, we would not be here today. Um, and that includes uh, Andrew Mary, who's stuck in traffic on the fly, unfortunately. <laughs> 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 Thank you, guys. Um, also, the faculty that, that uh, participated, and, and you know, normally faculty kind of sit in their, their warm, comfortable, or I should say, chilled, uh, cozy offices uh, and kind of direct from afar. But one of the really interesting things about this um, higher experience is that we, we actually get everybody together. Uh, doing the same thing. And so we had a lot of faculty actually came with us. It was kind of a small army uh, to Australia and uh, played a really pivotal key role in developing the field work and, and then also analyzing the data um, and uh, just making it an overall wonderful experience. And I wanted to acknowledge uh, some of the faculty that were involved. Um, uh, Richard Ambrose, who, as I understand it, is Skyping in from UCLA. So we <laughs> Lisa Levin um, from Scripps Institution of Oceanography, who is unfortunately sick and won't be able to make it today, but let's get her in. Right. Um, Professor Peter, Peter Bowler here at uh, UC Irvine. So, hey, Peter. Um, who I don't know if she's here yet or not, but anyway, my understanding is she's on your way. So, <laughs> Professor Amir Agarpichak, who is uh, in the back there. And you know, the other thing that's really wonderful about this program is, is the graduate students and the role that they play in sort of bringing everything together. Um, it really is, um, it, it takes a village, right? Um, and I wanted to, to thank them as well and call them out. So Emily Parker, um, so <laughs> and, uh, um, I wanted to thank uh, two of the folks we have here from Smart Start, Jessica Martone <laughs> and Audrey Wolf. So, yeah, uh, and actually, you know, I think that I forgot to mention Sharnia. So, uh, Sharnia is <laughs> 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 um, I tell you anybody else. Uh, James. James. Oh, of course. Yes. <laughs> but it's really funny. On my list here, I have James Starr. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I want to thank also Ava. James, you actually brought everything together. So thank you so much. All right, with that, let's transition to the presentations and, uh, and see what the other guys have done. So.
Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, before we begin, uh, I'd first like to have my team introduce themselves. So we'll start off with the uh, young gentleman over there. Hey. <laughs> I'm Ronald Donald. Trent Saunders. Tony Grimaldi, UPSP. Paul Barton, UCLA. And I'm Freddie Garcia. I'm a UC San Diego undergraduate student. Uh, to simply state, our presentation today will be with modeling water budgets for urban biofilters. Um, I will begin this presentation with a brief background on water budgets and biofilters. I will also shortly state uh, the question we asked ourselves upon conducting this research. Uh, to follow up, the rest of my team will further discuss the methods and results we obtained upon doing this research. Um, and yes, let's, let's begin. Uh, so the issue we are faced with uh, arises from the growth of urban development. Um, this human uh, cost phenomenon uh, has transformed the natural landscape in a number of ways. Um, oops, sorry. <laughs> has transformed the landscape in a number of ways. Um, and essentially, uh, one of the main components that we uh, uh, researched was evapotranspiration and filtration of water runoff. As you can see from the uh, pictures up above on the on your right. Um, Essentially, the main components that govern this cycle uh, are those three, and moving from top to bottom, DT decreases slightly, water runoff and evapotranspiration uh, are the main fluctuations within the cycle. Uh, in addition, in order to combat this uh, issue, uh, adoption of practices and policies are needed to manage the stormwater runoff in these developed areas. Uh, here, well, one of these practices is a biofilter, also known as a bioretention system. All it is is a vertically oriented engineered treatment system that filters water and pollutants using natural low energy process. Uh, here is a little standard design from our friends from Australia. Uh, as of 2010, this is a standard design for most of the biofilters. Uh, so we essentially just have a basic inlet of water coming in uh, from either runoff uh, water runoff or rainfall. Uh, in addition, uh, water is temporarily stored within the system, either through the ponding zone, uh, plant tissue, or soil sediment. And the uh, uh, outflow of water essentially exits as either drainage, evapotranspiration, or overflow. And then uh, here, listed here are some of the beneficial functions of a biofilter. Uh, we will be focusing primarily on flood control and we'll briefly discuss our groundwater recharge. Uh, but as you can see, there are little, uh, a lot of benefits that come with these biofilters. Uh, and the two pictures displayed are an urban biofilter on the top right and a more uh, recreational area, an open space biofilter on the bottom. So they could vary by a very different size depending on the engineering design and what you want to optimize. Uh, from here, I'll hand it over to my friend Paul. Uh, so our research question is, how is the water balance of an urban biofilter in Melbourne affected by drought? Um, and the area that we focused on was a biofilter on Camorn Street in Melbourne. In its plant, the plant in the filter is Ficinia nodosa. And uh, we looked at data from 1911 to 2012 for the precipitation. We primarily focused on the millennium drought and the years right after that. And then here is how we broke it down those years. We got the drought years in red and then blue is right after. And you can see that the average during the drought was pretty constant. But a key takeaway here is that in 05 it was actually the largest storm of the period. And then here is the bucket model that we used to calculate all the various components. The first term on the far left for y'all is the water accumulation. And in the biofilter media, the second term the R plus Q is the rainfall over both the catchment area and the biofilter, and that's just simply a lift stream coming through. <coughs> Excuse me. And the final terms are the evapotranspiration, drainage, and T overflow, which you can think of as an exit uh, flow, if you will, for all of the water. So um, a major part of the model was figuring out how much water that fell on our catchment actually made it into the biofilter, which is represented by 
QN, and it's actually the equivalent depth of water flowing in, so it's given in millimeters per day. And the way we went about doing this was using the rational method, which we slightly modified. And um, what you see is that we only had daily precipitation values on a, a time scale from 1911 to 2013. So with that, we had to figure out how much of that water is getting into our aquifer. And um, the way the formula works is we have the precipitation times a ratio of area catchment divided by area biofilter. And then you multiply it by a runoff coefficient, which is um, a range of zero to one. Zero means that if the water falls on the catchment, none of it would come in. And one would mean that all the water that falls on the catchment comes in. And then lastly, we have a SI unit conversion of 0.28, which is like K. So to find the runoff coefficient, we uh, use IDF tables. and Really, I'll, I'll give you a brief overview of what you guys are looking at. So up on the top, you see the return period, and that's how often the storm would occur. So 10 years would be a storm that occurs every 10 years, statistically. And then on the left-hand side, you have the duration, which is how long the storm lasted. And in this middle part is the intensity of the storm in millimeters per hour. So our, one of our major assumptions in the model was that our storm had a duration of three hours. And we just went off that assumption um, looking at other research papers that we'd seen. And with that, we were able to calculate the average intensity for every storm that we had. So on the next, oh yeah, so as I mentioned, the duration was three hours, so we were focused on this part of the graph. And with that, we were able to see um, how often the storm would have occurred. So say we have an intensity of 12, that storm would have occurred every five years statistically. And then with that, we move on to the next table, which is a runoff coefficient table. So with the return periods, we matched up to the matching coefficient. Um, so as I mentioned, if we had a five-year storm, it would be an average of that 0.77 and 0.8, because we assumed our catchment was a, um, an equal mix of asphalt and concrete. And if it fell between one of these two ranges, let's say it was seven and a half years, we interpolated using um, interpolation between the points and assumed it was a linear match. So with that, we were able to calculate all the runoff coefficients. And on the next slide, you see one more. So with that runoff coefficient, we had everything we needed to calculate QN, which is in this parentheses. And the last term R was just the amount of water that fell on our biofilter. And that was just the amount of precipitation that day. So we had all our inputs. And so the, what you see here is the model inputs for the exiting flow that I was talking about earlier. You see the various variables that we use for those. So in order to calculate ET and drainage, which is the L term, we use various saturation points in there, the hydroscopic uh, saturation point, low state point, and simply water stress and fuel capacity, all these values are split here. And the switch statement is basically talking the various E's and L's for us. So on the next slide, you'll see that we compare saturation to Minneapolis perspiration, and it makes a lot of sense because at the simply water stress point, where there's, like, so if there's very little water, obviously the saturation in the soil will go down. So when you see at the simply water stress point, you see that there's not very much water, so obviously there's not going to be that much water going into the air from the pipes that are put there. So, yeah. And then on the next slide, you can see saturation compared to drainage. And once again, not much will drain when there's not much water being rained on. So, obviously, the more saturated you get, the more drainage you will have. And for Q overflow, Q overflow, you calculate, like I didn't show the, 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 um, the switch statement for Q overflow, but that's because Q overflow is based upon both, or it's based upon L, which is then based upon S. So you kind of have this two statements that you have to do. And so it's, but generally speaking, it's based on if the water is, or the soil is saturated enough, and if your drainage cannot take care of all the inflow for it, then you will have uh, overflow for it. And this is just something that will, I guess, we'll use, we can either put it into a storage tank or it can go straight out to whatever the urban runoff situation is, so drain or whatever. <clears throat> and within, oh, sorry. And within our period, we only have really five points. There's like one right there, one right there, right there, and then one way up here. And so one of those is actually the uh, campus storm that we had at one year. So um, yeah, very few points of the bottom folks are not being able to handle all the rain. So once we've had all our data, our, um, our drainage, our evapotranspiration, and our uh, overflow, we decided to model that data using the ternary diagram. Um, so I'm going to kind of explain it. So there's basically three ways water can leave the system. Through harvest, which is basically removing the water from the watershed. So in our case, harvest is going to be evapotranspiration. 
There's also infiltration, which is what we refer to as drainage. Water is draining into the ground, infiltrating the ground. Um, and overflow, which is overland runoff. Once the biofilter has reached its capacity, can't take in any more water, it's just going to run down into the stream or sewer system. Um, so basically, any point on this diagram is going to add, have to add up to 100%. So there's going to be, um, so for instance, for this point on the diagram, if you look at this uh, vertex is 100% drainage, this vertex is 100% overflow, and the top vertex is 100% evapotranspiration. So this point here, for example, is going to be um, only 10% drainage. So it would be 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 100%. Um, and you can see the other points as well. So going on to the next slide, how does this relate to our original model? Um, we have our evapotranspiration in the top um, corner. And then we have uh, our overflow, which is anything running off, and our drainage. And what we also have shown on our ternary diagram, um, we have one that's a contour plot and one that's just plotting the data points. And each of these data points that is plotted represents a single day. Um, and the points are going to all have a color. And what that color represents is saturation. So what we're doing is we're re relating um, the saturation of that data point um, to how the water is leaving the system with that given. So here's the table of the actual um, percentages of each of the three ways that water leaves. You can see that they're similar for each period, and about two-thirds of it is drainage, and one-third would be ET. And then here we actually put it on the diagram. So you can do all of them. Yeah, they're all about in this one spot because they're all pretty similar. And so that just shows that even though we had drought versus non-drought, they all were in that same area. And then here we have the plotted with the saturation. And once again, ET is at the top, and then drainage and overflow are on the bottom. And another interesting thing that saturation tells us is that that 0.22 mark, that's where plants start to experience water stress. And that 0.11, they start to die. And so those dark blues, if they're on here, then that means plants were experiencing stress or dying. And there's very little blue, even though it's drought. And then here is where that was at storm. So we actually had an overflow event. So that's why the contour plot is much nicer. And then it goes back to normal. And then post MD is still looks the same. And here's all of them put again. And then yeah, so we had all that white space on the on the three that didn't have overflow. And that just is because there was no overflow. And then yeah, to reiterate. The water saturation was even during drought enough for the plants to be happy. So, looking at our results, we had a couple discussion points. And the first thing that we noted was that depending on what function you want to maximize, you could design your both biofilter and engineer it to promote that. So, one of them could be you want to promote ET to maintain the natural water cycle. And the way you go about doing that that we recommend is maintaining a saturation level between the insipid point and flow capacity, where ET is highest. And also at these points, there's no drainage. So theoretically, all the water that's coming in is going to out at ET, top transpiration. Uh, another thing that someone might want to design for is to maximize drainage, either if you want to recharge a groundwater aquifer. So what we just noted was that if you want to do that, you would go about maintaining saturation above flow capacity. And um, ideally, full, full saturation, but this would promote uh, more infiltration. And then also, you want to design for your soil media and you want to take something with a higher hydroelectric activity, allowing a faster rate of infiltration. And while our model shows us um, these different ways we could like tweak engineering wise um, the system, we also have to take into consideration like the variability in climates and the fact that um, Melbourne has a very you know different rainfall, annual rainfall than we do here in Southern California. So when we think about how we can adapt this technology um, for use in Southern California, that's definitely something to consider. So Melbourne actually receives about 1.7 times the amount of annual rainfall as we do here in Irvine. Um, and so what this is going to mean, uh, what we assumed this to mean, is that you would have low, lower soil saturation, um, which could actually promote uh, a higher portion of the water budget leaving the system through evapotranspiration. Um, there may be less opportunity for infiltration, so it's less likely that we'll be able to, you know, replenish our groundwater fully just through biofilters. 
Um, and there's also a larger possibility of plants reaching the stress level to where they would die off if they're not seeing those plants. Um, so these are all kind of our assumptions based on our model and what we've you know learned so far. But we would definitely like to see you know the same experiment repeated, but like with data here in Southern California. Um, and then I would also like to point out that although I said you know in Southern California CT might account for a larger portion um, of the water budget. It's also important to note that DT is limited by your plant species. So Bithynia nodosa is the plant species we were looking at, which is actually rated very efficiently. But even that plant species only has a 7.5 millimeter per day um, transpiration rate. So if you did want to basically increase how much water is being harvested, so for instance, um, if you're worried about groundwater contamination, um, or you don't want to have so much runoff into the streams or sewer systems, and you are really looking to maximize harvest, you need to um, look at, you know, ET. And so basically, one way you could maximize ET, which I think Trent might have mentioned before, is controlling the flow rate of water into the system. So if you can control the saturation of the soil, basically you can control um, water being evapotranspired instead of just infiltrating into the ground. But you would need a very large storage tank to hold all the water before you slowly drain it into the system to make sure that ET is actually being maximized. So instead, a better option is moving forward for us to think about adapting these systems with other technologies um, in a way that we can capture the water through the biofilter and then take it off for use for toilets, um, irrigation, recycled water, basically. Um, and so just some concluding points we came um, out with is that climate actually has little to no effect on the water budget um, throughout the whole time period during drought and post drought. Um, ET remained at about 35% of the outflow and drainage only remained at 65% or remained at 65% of the outflow. Um, and on top of that, overflow was rarely reached. Rarely reached. Um, so in the whole 100 year time span of data we had, it occurred five times. In the results we were looking at, it was really only two times or once in the in our data set. Um, and so this could mean, you know, the biofilters are doing their function. Um, but that's something, you know, we need to think about what do we want the biofilter to do here? What is your end result? Um, also, even during time to drought, the system rarely reached um, the wilting point or the incipient stress point for the plants. So that was a positive. And just overall, the biofilter design is really what's going to dictate the water budget more than rain quality. And thank you to everyone who helped out. Um, we really appreciate all your mentorship and your support. Any questions? Uh, you know, I'm looking at your triangle, which is beautiful and, and fascinating. It's clearly very parallel to the soil triangle. And I was wondering if you were going to try to, uh, in your publication, produce some formula that would allow you to use the soil triangle to show how much drainage uh, would be appropriate for a particular area. Can you explain the soil triangle? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's the classic thing. The top is clay, on the left is sand, uh, and then silt is on the right. And it's, it's the soil triangle, and everything is mixtures of that. If you if you see it, you'll instantly see the parallel. Okay. I assumed it actually yeah. used that as a basis for your yeah, no, uh, design. That's it. That's all the so effectively, it's very very similar. Yeah. yeah. Maybe I should answer that. <laughs> since I, I, I forced them to, to do it this time. So we, we published a paper last year in Environmental Science and Technology. You remember Peter Murata, I think. Yeah. Um, and so one of the things we said is that. That basically the entire universe of LI low impact development technologies could be represented on this triangle. And so, what I thought would be really great for these guys is to take a single biofilter water budget forced by a long time series of rainfall and see kind of where it falls. So, yeah. this is probably the first implementation of that idea of you know, going from a kind of very rigorous understanding of the water budget and, and kind of looking at, at mapping out this technology. Um, but absolutely, I mean, going forward, it makes a lot of sense to start doing this a lot. And I was actually talking to this all um, uh, as uh, you know, one possibility for the next paper. Yeah. Thank you.
And, and I really like the idea of getting back to the soil triangle because yeah. that, of course, affects hydraulic fertility, which is a big part of the drainage yeah. aspect of this as well. So and I think probably to... one formula can translate. I'm sorry. I, I think that uh, mathematically it wouldn't be too hard just looking at the two to translate between them. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, um, I didn't catch it, but what, do you know approximately what the um, the average catchment or drainage area was for these uh, for the 24 sites? For the particular site that we looked at, it was about like 15 uh, square meters. Uh, but most of these, um, so this particular bio filter is actually on a single street with a uh, series of bio filters. Uh, but we had the particular data that this filter had 15 square meters in a uh, specific cash area, which is I believe like 366 uh, square meters. Mm -hmm. uh, but most of the bio filters that we visited in Australia varied within uh, size and uh, type of runoff that they would uh, deal with. So, yeah. Okay. It's really here small. <laughs> it's really small. Yeah. 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 Is it, I mean, there's a, you know, there's a lot in there. In Orange County, we have a lot of, you know, there's a lot of really small ones, I'd say, that are, you know, 15 square meters is really small. But, you know, probably like, you know, 100 square meters. And then we just put one in Irvine here that's about 20 hectares. And it's, kind of, put it charitably, it hasn't done very well. Um, forming in terms of urban runoff, pollution yeah. removal, and whatnot. So I was just kind of kind of curious. So yeah. are, these are mostly really small. Yeah, yeah like, like, on like this sidewalk. one's huge though. This one, yeah, the one we yeah. looked at was small. Yeah. We weren't even looking at pollution uh, removal. Yeah. We were only looking at specifically water balance. Yeah, well, I'm sorry. I, I, yeah, yeah. yeah, but also yeah. also water balance. Oh. That's it. See, that has a lot to do with yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. You can see that the one that we visited is on the bottom. Oh, uh, it's very small. You see, like barely Stay five corner. people sitting there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I should clarify too. So they visited 24 biofilters, varying in size enormously. Um, for the water budget analysis, we decided to focus them on a single biofilter. Okay, and this is the one they visited. Yeah, that's uh, fine. Yeah, I was just just curious what the, what the size. But, but just like Peter said, you know the principles that are using can be applied to them. Yeah, and we chose this site um, because it was in an urban area um, and because we had data on the size and the plant size. Well, Gloria, when you were calculating off and for each other flow, so for, for point, you're probably using the, the media and everything that you initially put into the right? So we went off of um, 2010 standards data um, because we knew they had gone through and redone a lot of those biofilters. So we um, referred back to the Melbourne design standards for 2010 and on. I'm wondering if you would expect the new characteristics, the soil characteristics to change over time in a way that would you know, change the amount of water in which it would reach yeah. Yeah. the that, Definitely. Like, I mean, the inflow supply would probably have the accumulation more fines and that would lower the hydraulic conductivity, so more of a clay type of material. And then in our model, that would make it so that less water is flowing down and needs to get higher fines. I mean, that's, but by the way, that's exactly what we're, we had, the problem we had at our facility is that it just accumulates silt and fines at the yeah. top, and then the, you know, it, it doesn't, it, it doesn't infiltrate anymore, and you have to, you know, have higher, higher, you know, hydrostatic pressure to infiltrate, and then you're basically now you're pond. <laughs> <laughs> we ran into some in Melbourne that were, the overflow was right at the end. Basically, went right into a gutter, and then maybe if the water raised high enough, then it would go over into a biofilter. But the design is not the best for certain yeah. yeah. There's a uh, <laughs> mirror. Yeah. yeah. Looks like your last one said that you like story about pollution. Is that right? Are you considering? Yeah. I think that yeah. it's in there, right? Yeah, so we have our Emax and our EW, the Emax being maximum tobacco yeah. transpiration and EW being maximum soil temperature. Did you like to talk about Correct. Yeah. Okay. Um, there's one option, but if you look at the projected temperature in Australia, it's you know, considered feature climate. It's close to the upper bound of global average. Yeah. So one thing that we can potentially explore in your publication is basically explain different feature temperature scenarios, adjust the EP, and see where that point moves in your 
triangle, this is going to be a lot more important. And that's beautiful. And basically, if we follow a trajectory, right? Right. So we tend to move more toward the teeth. I think, um, and I think one of our original ideas for modeling was actually based on temperature, um, but we didn't have. Well, we collected some temperature data, um, very minimal, but it was also um, the temperature we were collecting were from light sensors um, that were like relatively right next to each other, one under the plant material and one outside of it. Um, and it being winter time, we thought the temperature data wouldn't even be super accurate because it might actually be warmer under the plants than it is out in the sun. So we just didn't have the temperature data to actually do this this time. So instead, we modeled it based on temperature. Another uh, quick point is, you know, depending on what plants you're actually using in the biofilters, as you move into the clay type soils, it's, it'll be trickier and trickier for them to have functional arenchyma and lacunae systems that can get oxygen down the roots. So that's just one other, I mean, you might want to switch plants or something like yeah. that. I, I would say like on these, most of the, the soils are so sandy that they have problems with the drying out and yeah. all that. Couldn't be an issue. Yeah. They, they can really tolerate a lot of dry. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, if there are no other questions, let's give these guys a hand. <laughs>
And we also took auger samples, which we used to calculate loss on ignition to organic matter. And with this value, we converted it to organic carbon matter using the ratio 0.55, which is found in um, one of our papers. And so we developed three research questions and found a code for each of them. So our first question is, what plant life strategies do biofilter plants follow? And to approach this, we um, plotted our three plant life strategies onto a ternary diagram. Our second question is, how do plant life strategies impact carbon storage? And to do this, we evaluated our three plant life strategies onto a structural equation model. And our third question is, what is the economic value of biofilter carbon storage? And to, to do this, we plotted a carbon biofilter profile, and we found how much carbon was stored in our 24 biofilters, <coughs> and we put a value on them. So as Tess just mentioned, our first research question that we wanted to address was, what plant life strategies do biofilter plants follow? Um, so in order to address this question, we need to classify our plants by the three strategies. Um, CSR classification was from Pearson in 2013, and so the assumption that was made um, was that the high leaf area is associated with competitive life strategies. High, high leaf dry matter content is associated with stress tolerant life strategies. And high specific leaf area is associated with rural life strategies. Pierce et al. provided equations for us um, in order to estimate the CSR strategy for any plant using the leaf dry matter content, leaf area, and um, so prior to jumping into all of our results, I wanted to take a moment and um, this is one of our ternary diagrams. I know we previously saw one in the other group. And so this is for one of our grasses, Pelagia specific. And so it has um, three axes at the middle. And our first one that we have is stress tolerance and it went from zero to 100. And so anything located in that left corner would be considered highly stress tolerant. If you look at rural, it runs from zero to 100 up. Anything in that upper corner would be considered highly rural. And lastly, we have competitive from going from left to right. Anything in this right corner would be highly competitive. When we analyze, um, for example, we just put, um, chose a point for POA, we would be seeing that stress tolerance would be 60%, rural would be 10%, competitive would be 30. So POA would be stress, um, highly stress tolerant and rural and competitive would be low strategies. Here we have all of our results for the six genera that we use. We have our four ternary diagrams that were grouped by growth forms. So we have rushes, forks, grasses, and sedges. And overall, our results um, um, told us that biofilter plants are predominantly stress tolerant. So as we remember, and as I said before, it runs from zero to 100. Anything on the left corner would be considered stress tolerant. You can see everything is Located bunched down a little bit closer to the left. And all of our plants are have low rural strategies. So everything is located closer to the bottom. And lastly, as far as competitive, they are moderately competitive. They're all about less than 50%, with Lamandra being one of our pink boxes in the four over there. It's slightly more competitive than any of our other ones. Okay, so from there we wanted to see how these different plant strategies plant life strategies in our biofilters affect carbon storage in the shallow and deep um, soil. So we took our samples from all 24 sites, um, and you can see them all plotted here, how they're easily spread out. Um, and then we chose to represent our hypothesis using a structural equation model, um, as you can see over here. So our idea was that our competitive plants, food rural plants, and stress tolerant plants would all affect deep carbon uh, directly, which is indicated with those black arrows, or indirectly through the shallow carbon, as you can see with the green arrows. So when we tested this with maximum likelihood estimation, we actually found that our competitive plants actually decreased the amount of shallow carbon, um, and then our sorry, can this one, and then our stress tolerant plants actually increased that shallow carbon in the soil, and then our rural plants didn't have a significant effect on our shallow carbon storage at all, um, which is why it's that. And then unfortunately, none of these. Uh, had a direct effect on deep carbon. However, our competitive and our stress tolerant plants did affect our deep carbon storage indirectly through that shallow carbon, as you can see with that green arrow over there. So this is our entire path diagram that I just explained, um, just larger. And unfortunately, it's not the best model. Um, we have only 29% of our variance in shallow carbon storage explained by this model, and only 20% of our deep carbon variance 
So we wanted to test another hypothesis, and we wanted to see if any other carbon sources would affect our deep carbon and shallow carbon in the same way. So for here, we looked at our root mass, worm abundance, and leaf litter, and we tested them again, and we found that uh, none of them had a direct or indirect impact on deep or shallow carbon, which is a little surprising because you would think all of these, um, these are all organic and they're all in from the soil, yet they don't have any ties uh, or any significant ties with the storage. Um, we thought about it and we were thinking maybe it's just because you have a small sample size. For example, like Melbourne has 10,000 rain gardens and we sampled about 24 of them and that could just be potentially why. Another reason is that our data are noisy. It could be that um, they looked ugly the day we came, there weren't many worms present that day, or maybe someone had completed maintenance on the site and maybe swept away the leaf litter before we could come and collect it. Um, either way, it might be that we have just too much, um, like too subtle of effects to see within 24 sites. So our last question was trying to put an economic value of the carbon storage within the biocultures. So to do this, we first wanted to see where the majority of our carbon was being stored. To do this, uh, I used or we used auger samples to do to find at depth uh, points, and then we used leaf litter to find the surface level. Um, and so what we got was uh, this plot here. So on top we have the carbon, the x-axis is the carbon in grams, and the y-axis is in depth of centimeters. Uh, and we actually determined carbon using the the ratio that we had first discussed in the method. So we knew that uh, the ratio of 0.55 of organic matter is equivalent to grams of carbon. So we use that to determine this chart. Um, and so from this chart, we were able to understand that most of the carbon is being stored near surface or at surface. Um, and so we know that carbon is uh, stored in all areas of the biocultures, but we wanted to focus on deep storage because that is where uh, long-term storage occurs. Um, and so we found the average concentration of the deep storage carbon was 1.2 grams of carbon uh, per meter cube. Uh, so to get an actual dollar value, we did uh, a very long valuation process. So the first step is to estimate the concentration of deep carbon stored per auger core. Uh, we then used the biocultured depth to convert deep carbon per auger core to deep carbon to overall site. And in this case, depth means that we use the very bottom of the biofilter. Um, it was an auger sample that had just the soil at the bottom, so that would be the deep carbon. Uh, we then use the average deep carbon over all four sites, which is 24, uh, and then we multiplied the average deep carbon per site by the 10,000 rain gardens. We did this to try to get an overall dollar value for all 10,000 rain gardens in Melbourne. Uh, we then converted the total stored deep carbon to grams of carbon dioxide, and then converted grams of carbon dioxide to tons of carbon dioxide. And then we used a 2014 carbon market uh, in Australia to determine the value of the deep carbon. Um, in 2014, it was $24.13 per tons of carbon dioxide. Uh, so using this, we, did, uh, we found that the estimated, uh, estimated amount of, the overall, um, value that deep carbon is worth is thirteen thousand um, dollars but we also understand that this is an overestimating overestimation because a lot of the sites we sampled were actually quite large um, but overall the ten thousand rain gardens they're actually on average smaller so we went back and did an average and assumed that 85 percent of the biofilters we used would be smaller and 15 percent would be larger so we went back to what we did on the slide before and weighted it, and we got a value of 7,000, which is about half of the previous value. Um, what this tells us is that biofilters are not the answer to climate change, but they're also not supposed to be. Um, the carbon sequestration that the uh, that is a co-benefit, along with many other co-benefits, is still very important. Uh, the next discussion will actually talk about it. Um, and this dollar figure underestimates the true value of carbon in biofilters because carbon drives a lot of other things, such as microbial respiration, which drives other important ecosystem services, such as denitrification. So in conclusion, uh, stress tolerant and competitive plant life strategies impact biofilter carbon storage capacity differently. Further research is needed to evaluate the life strategy of more biofilter plants and their effect on carbon storage capacity and other ecosystem services. 
And biofilters are not built to store carbon. This is just an additional co-benefit. And our valuation method does not take into account other co-benefits of storing carbon, including vegetation, plant restoration, all which also have a dollar value. And if California implemented the equivalent number and size of biofilters as Melbourne, uh, their value would be worth around $3,000 to $6,000 on the California carbon market of 2014. Um, and this is definitely not enough to offset the cost of construction of them, but it should be factored into their overall value to both the ecosystem and humans. So, um, this project was funded through the Partnership of International Research and the Research Grant from the National Science Foundation. And we would just like to thank all the wonderful people that helped us along the way. Most of the media that they use in biofilters is really carbon poor. You know, it's, it's mostly sand. Um, so, how do you think that deep carbon compares to the amount that might be stored as living plants, especially when it's on the surface, you know, in the shallower depths of the uh, you think that, I mean, the value, the number, the dollar dollars you expressed were pretty small. You know, not enough that someone really care about as far as, you know, you just conserve it. But I'm wondering, could it be a lot larger than expected in the plants, living plant tissue in, in shallower carbon storage? Most likely, it would be a bit larger. Um, we didn't want to focus on the surface or near surface carbon because that's often uh, going in and out of the system so quickly that it wouldn't be a good representation. Another suggestion is just looking at the plant life strategies that we've listed before. Some of them include that they take up a lot of resources to develop larger, thicker leaves. So that may be a reason why there's more. They could there could be more carbon in the plant. <laughs> well, this is this is a sort of off base thing anyway. But, uh, you know, it seems to me to be interesting to look at uh, not just carbon, but things like selenium, because I think the big potential for biofilters uh, would not be so much as to concentrate selenium, but to uh, outgas it, to volatilize it. Things like saltgrass, uh, coastal bulbs, there are lots of species that do that a lot, and that would be another. Benefit that could be built into, uh, you know, the whole uh, contribution. Yeah, I mean, this is an interesting problem, right? Because, uh, like Andrew was looking at uh, nitrous oxide production, so there are also potential fist services, um, for example, greenhouse gas um, production um, due to incomplete nitrification of the algae. And uh, so you don't know the balance whether, in fact, um, the biofilters will say in that. Greenhouse gas emitter or um, a store. Yeah. So, but anyway, very, uh, very good start down that road. Other questions? Let's give them a hand. Hello everyone, we are here to uh, discuss biofilter uh, co-benefits, and from that we will be evaluating the social and environmental drivers of these co-benefits. So here's our team, we can start off with me. Uh, my name is Waldo Martinez, I major in environmental science. I will be a uh, fourth year here at UCI, and you can just call me a water enthusiast. Uh, next we have Maria Lindsay, uh, Salish, and Eager with us today. Is boarding a plane to Alaska. But I can tell you that she's an environmental science major. She recently graduated from UCLA and she specializes in water rights. And my name is Viviana Colomo. I'm a fan of the I'm a biology major. I'll be a fourth year student at this school and I'm the CEO of an organization called Love of Community. 
focusing on creating sustainable communities, not the side setting with clean water systems. So we can start off the outline of today's presentation. We'll be starting off uh, by giving you a brief background about stormwater and biofilters. Then we can jump into the research that we did. First, there's a part one, which was defining biofilter co benefits in Australia. And the second part of this research was identifying the drivers of these co benefits in Australia. And from that, we can derive future implications. Um, you know, it could be about improving green infrastructure, technology, green health. So before we jump into what co-benefits are, we should learn what uh, pri primary uh, primary benefits of bubbles are. So the primary benefits are twofold. First, you're going to have the water quality aspect. You know, it's it's designed to degrade pollutants such as metals. Some of those metals could be copper and zinc. And you also have pollutants that you can degrade such as uh, fecal indicator bacteria and chemicals. The list goes on. Secondly, you also have the hydrology aspect. And so, biofilters also work to mitigate floods in urban environments. So, what exactly are co benefits? Co benefits are the added benefits you get in addition to your primary benefits. Some of these things could be things like artistic features, amenities, recreational services, cultural services, and that sometimes blends into aesthetics and total educational value. You also have your habitat services, which could be something like richness, diversity. And finally, you also have things like regulating services. And most importantly, plants, these plants are designed to regulate our <coughs> What are the drivers? Well, some of the main drivers or examples that we can give you are something like governance, you know, that can stem into maintenance and political will. You also have your land use drivers, your demographics, your engineering, and your climate factors that give rise to biofuels or benefits. And so rather than coming up with the hypothesis, we figured we can come up with two really specific questions that can narrow down our research. First, we wanted to ask, what are the primary human and ecosystem co-benefits exhibited in Melbourne, Australia, biofilters? Secondly, are human and ecosystem co-benefits of biofilters related to social and environmental drivers such as funding, demographics, land use, climate, and species richness? And for a brief pause, we will actually be playing an audio uh, for you, describing some of the methods that we use in terms of research. Are you starting from the top? So first off, our field data for ecosystem. Sorry for that. Flip it down. And now we have our methods. So what we're going to be showing you is first our field data collection when we were in Melbourne, Australia. We have our ecosystem co-benefits and human co-benefits and what we collected to analyze those. Driver identification, principal component analysis, and multiple linear regression. So first off, our field data for ecosystem co-benefits. When we were out in the field in Melbourne, Australia, we collected a ton of data and we really had to condense that down to what we wanted to analyze and what we wanted to look at. So of our representative sample, 24 biofilters in Melbourne, Australia, we took from that plant richness data, which was from our biofilter plants and weeds, how many appeared on the transects when we were studying at each site, the maximum transect height of the tallest plant in that location, the species percent coverage, the root biomass, leaf litter mass, as well as worm biomass per biofilter area. We also took um, records of which birds, mammals, and insects appeared there for wildlife presence, how many were in and around the area while we were studying, we logged that down. As observations. We also wanted to see if there was infrastructure visible and if it was near a major road. And we also had standing water and one of our biofilters actually flooded one day and we had to go back, as well as the total biofilter size. And from this we also looked at different indices like the Shannon Diversity Indice for how many species appeared there as a cover population, as well as the Wildlife Friendly Indice as a total count of how many things we saw there, like plant richness, animal species, and all that, as one total number. And then we had our human co-benefit data, again collected from the Draper biofilters. And this was mostly observations we logged when we were out there. Is the biofilter visible to the public? Are there recreational amenities? Are there jogging paths? Is it pet accessible? Are there dogs there? Play structures? Is there a sitting area like a bench? Or another thing, is it facing the biofilter, is it facing the way? Are there artistic features? And then we also were able to tabulate a total recreational value score, as well as the total educational value score. And educational value was mainly based on signage and if the signage was defaced. 
There's also aesthetic value, just general, is it pretty, is it green, open space? Would people go there and look at it? And then also a value seeing if it protects an environmentally sensitive area. And then we needed to look at our drivers and identify them from both sides, ecosystem as well as human. And we mainly came across um, demographic data, income, age of the population there, ethnicity percentages, indigenous percentage, and education level. The party which was in power while the biosystem was funded and built, and the main parties were labor, liberal, and greens. Land use classification, urban, peri-urban, rural, if it's a park, commercial, or industrial, as well as climate, which could be temperature or precipitation and rainfall. And below here, you can see the different data sources we went to and the national agencies. Um, for the climate, for instance, we got it from the Australian Soil Resource Information System. For the demographic and the area land use classification, we got from Victoria State Government agencies and um, data sources. And then for our methods, we did principal component analysis, first using our co-benefits to see the major pattern. And I just want to thank Meg so much because she really helped us out with this portion. And she worked in MATLAB to do that. And basically, PCA identified the dominant human and ecosystem co-benefit patterns at every site, as well as how strong they are. And it shoots out the ones that are strongest and we can read them. And it was run separately for human co-benefits as well as ecosystem co-benefits to see the separate patterns from either of those. After we ran the PCA, we took the dominant patterns and then wanted to see what drivers would lead to those. We did multiple linear regression, which identified these drivers matched with the dominant co-benefit patterns. Co-linear variables identified using variance inflation factor were omitted from all models to condense and get a clearer view of the data and what we were looking at. In the same way, best fit models were selected using Bayesian information criterion to also limit the extent of the scope and what we were looking at. And here are the results for the dominant human co-benefit patterns. PCA identified two main dominant modes or patterns that explain 53% of the variance in our data. Mode one, as you can see here on this axis, is the aesthetic and recreational value. And mode two is the educational value. And you can kind of see where all these vectors are shooting off where it shows the dominant patterns. Um, the one up top, total educational value, is matched um, in a positive zone. And then below that, you have sign to face, also an educational value in the negative portion. And um, likewise, if you look to the right, positive values was total aesthetic value, total recreational value, and all the ones kind of related to that. And what we found here is, if you look in the legend, you can see five different biofilters have been um, sort of highlighted, so you can see the different ones. Edinburgh Gardens and Morrison Reserve are the most park-like systems, and they've been marked with red. Um, Primorne Street is a typical curb cutout, but it has an educational value. In this case, the sign was defaced. And then Fernhill Road and Honor Street are, again, typical curb cutouts just on the side of the street meant for an infrastructure use and purpose, not really as much of an aesthetic in a park and place to go. And the park light systems did have a very high aesthetic and recreational value, while the curb cutouts, likewise, had very low aesthetic and recreational values. And again, Creamhorn had the low educational value due to the sign being defaced. And if you look here, we have our dominant ecosystem co-benefit patterns. Unlike the human co-benefit patterns, this one was a lot more randomized. There weren't as many dominant ones coming out. We pretty much had one main motor pattern that was identified, which was the wildlife-friendly one. Um, if it was a wildlife friendly system, it was far from roads with little visible infrastructure. PCA was able to identify this one mode to explain about 30% of the variance in our data. And again, park like systems had a more positive wildlife friendly ecosystem co benefit than those of the curb cutouts. And you still see there is sim similar location to the previous one, but it's much more randomized. The vectors are kind of going all the way around. Roots and worms are down below for mass, where litter mass is above. It's not as well explained. And in our results, when we went to multiple linear regression, we wanted to see the drivers. And in human co-benefits, we found three significant drivers based on the data that we had. Human co-benefit drivers are listed here by the average level of importance. Those colored in green are the ones that I mentioned which were significant. Income was above and by far the most significant with nearly 100% in average um, importance. Rural followed and then rain. And you can see the coefficients. Um, in there, and MLR basically evaluates all components across all the different models, and then we want to see which ones were significant. And then we also took the observed human co-benefits against the predicted human co-benefits, combining all of our data in this cross plot, 
And the model really does capture um, the observed co-benefits well for most of the biofuel <coughs> systems. There's just a few outliers that don't really follow this line, which were the food systems. Center for Gardens and Morrison Reserve, um, again, are seen as a bit of an exception. They have more observed co-benefits than predicted by our model, which is good. I mean, they're doing all right. And there they are right there on the ground. And then here's the ecosystem co-benefit drivers looking back. Um, there was no significant driver found when evaluated for these ones. We do not know what drives the benefits in the system. You can see here where we have barred the 80% of importance, and all of these ones didn't get anywhere close to that. They're all below 40% of average importance. Well, we get our slides ready. Uh, after our methods and results, we go to our discussion. And we realized that uh, significant human co benefit drivers include a brain in how level are normalized. What do I mean by drivers? Um, let's take an example of income level. It means uh, the amount of income in the community determines the human co benefits for the vice versa. Um, so, communities with enough funding and land can have a sufficient annual rainfall to sustain biofilter plants had by filters with the most human co benefits. It's so tragic to note that one of the primary drivers is income, um, but systems should be cited nearly equal to both. Climate, social factors, and doubleness do not explain our dominant ecosystem co benefit factors. We hypothesize that an evaluated variable such as their filter maintenance and habitat fragmentation may be the possible drivers. <coughs> Research and governance, ensuring that these systems are well designed, implemented equitably, appropriately maintained, and confer sufficient human and ecosystem co benefits is of the utmost importance. Scientists and engineers often focus on the primary benefits of these systems. It is important to also remember that and include the core benefits and equity. A multi-campus research proposal has, written, has recently been submitted and had an opportunity to read it, which would evaluate by filter human and ecosystem core benefits and their drivers. Our analysis is the first step toward combining the crisis of urban to promote that model. <coughs> Acknowledgement. The National Science Foundation higher granted facilitated the international research partnership between the University of California Irvine and the University of Melbourne. A special thanks to our esteemed Stanley Grant PhD, David Feldman PhD, Megan Murphy PhD, Brandon Wilson PhD, Andrew Mirren PhD, Hiroshi Ishikawa PhD, Peter Boala PhD, Richard Ambrose PhD, and the entire UCI higher team for their guidance, knowledge, and support throughout our research. Thank you. We all have any questions? Yeah, so hmm. questions for the team. Bear in mind we have our invisible friend <laughs> who is not here with us. Yes, please. <laughs> Great work, very, very interesting. Um, all those things you called in, say, recreational value, how do you call the primary data to into the data analysis? Is that on a scale, the data coding? How do you decide this area has recreational value rated at whatever number? Um, I think you can refer it to Megan. I can, uh, I can help uh, answer that one um, since I did some of the coding. Um, Marina did the other part of the coding, which she can't answer for herself right now. Yeah, it's great work. Yeah, so a, a lot of the, it, it could vary depending on uh, what we decided we wanted to weigh as a recreational benefit. But there were some things that were really clear whether or not um, the biofilter had, there's one that had a skate park near it, it had tennis courts near it surrounded by benches that all face the wild filter. So those would be like the skate park and would be a recreational benefit. Many of them were coded as presence absence mm -hmm. for simplicity's sake. Mm -hmm. um, and some of them we would take a full sum. So for total recreational value, you'd have a whole set of things like dog accessibility, people would bring their pets. Yeah, yeah and then just sum yeah. all of those sort of binary variables for <laughs> full recreational. And same with the educational value. So in that case, we took if there was no educational sign in presence, that presence that would be a zero. If they had educational signs, that would be a one. If they had it, but it was in face, someone could read it over it, that was a negative one. Mm -hmm. so, There's a lot of components. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
uh, would gain more from it. Yeah, I, I agree, but I hope this turn will look like moss. Yeah. So we don't really see what's going on, it's all in the ground. So probably some understanding of what the function is. Well, it would make it more acceptable to you. Awesome. Andrew, you had a question? I was just wondering, did you use the income <coughs> from construction or the most recent income? Because you know, some of these neighborhoods are changing pretty rapidly. <coughs> and you know, what was the, the lower income neighborhood could be the next most popular place to live, you know, in mm -hmm. any area in Melbourne. So I mean, which I think it's the most recent yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah, I just kind of uh, reflecting back on what you said, Andrew, I I was really surprised by this too because I thought of all the places that you could potentially go, Melbourne would be kind of the most egalitarian in a way. Um, you know, and most of these systems were funded through Melbourne Water, you know, so there was an external funding process, right? So it wasn't just like the local communities funded it, but maybe it gets to institutional capacity, right? So that, that basically neighborhoods with more money have councils which have more wherewithal to put together the proposals to submit to the Melbourne Water to get the beautiful well, I, I really don't know. I would also bet that it had success, you know, once it seemed like the ones that were successful had multiple. So sort of once you got one, it was easier to get another one. Any other questions? Well, let's give it to you now. <laughs> And so I've been instructed um, to let you guys know that the next phase is essentially a poster session. So we have both the posters for um, the talks that you just heard. So you can um, ask hopefully tough questions that you may have been observing. You may have been why you guys did that question. So you can ask the tough questions. Uh, so please go around. But we also have um, the posters from the Rocket program. So the Rocket uh, teachers haven't presented it, but they do have the posters. So uh, please do uh, wander around and have a look and uh, and then uh, ask them tough questions too. Mm -hmm. And then I think we have food coming. Is that correct, Liz? Yeah, it should be ready in about 10 minutes. Beautiful. So uh, please enjoy and, uh, and then we can have some beer in the morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.